Welcome to the Vocal Lab Podcast with your hosts, Shelby Rollins and Jason Catrone, bringing you the best from the music industry. Get ready for first class conversations packed with exclusive techniques and transformative insights, all designed to help you reach your top note. Hey everyone, welcome to today's podcast. I'm Jason Catrone. And I'm Shelby Rollins. And we are Vocal Lab Collective. We are. We are here. Here we are. And we're in a new space. Yes. What do you think about it, Shelby? I like it. I like the pink color you chose in here. Did you choose yeah. this pink color? I did not. It was um, painted like this when you got yes. in the space? We're in my studio today. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're going to see an evolution of spaces over time, I think, as we yes. get into this podcast. Like next time? New chairs. Yeah. No offense to these chairs. These are cool, but we no, need oh, a three. I got a cool story about these chairs. Chair. We do need a third chair. Yeah, tell but the story about the chair. I have a cool story chair. about these chairs. To the paint. So I went to the Bahamas um, this two years ago. I went on a trip down there uh, for a couple weeks. And while I was gone, a friend of mine, a very good friend, who is a very amazing like uh, designer. She's an antiquer. She has an antique shop um, or two or three, something. And she was like, let me come in and design your space mm. while you're gone. I remember I, this. I just moved in here. I remember when this happened. I gave her a very minimal budget. Yeah. Right? What were your, like, buzzwords? Like, I want, you know, well, shabby chic, no, which I, is not your vibe, but I mean. Yeah, I didn't, really, I didn't really have a buzzword. It was uh. the fact that. Again, we've been friends for a while. She yeah. had been, and during COVID, we would send stuff back and forth on Instagram all the time. Just funny bits, memes, stylistic things, especially mm-hmm. around horses, because I love horses. Yeah. And um, all things Kentucky, because I'm from Kentucky. Uh, cars and houses and suits, just like design things I like, because yeah. we would just go back and forth with it. <clears throat> and she would see things from time to time and be like, oh, this looks like a house you would like. And I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. So I didn't know this, but she was keeping a um, Like a file. Pinterest board for she you. She was keeping a Pinterest board for yeah. me. And so when she said it, she's like, I already know what you like. Like, I know exactly what to do. I'm like, okay, go for it. I gave her a That's budget, awesome. which wasn't crazy. Yeah. She tripled the budget when I got back. She, for her first words were, um, it was kind of like a HGTV reveal. Oh, it was yeah. so cool, right? Yeah. So I came in. I did get teary-eyed because the space was just amazing, yeah. right? And um, like in, in the main space, you've seen it. She bought this old chandelier from a church out of St. Louis, and it's mm-hmm. hanging in the middle of my living room now. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the first things I saw. I was like, oh, my gosh. And she incorporated all these horse things that yeah. I already had a lot of it. Some of it she got. But... It Cheers. just looked amazing, and she was like, now, don't be upset. Um, I did spend a little more than you told me I could. I was like, oh, gosh. That's still been a point of contention, but <laughs> <laughs> as with everyone, they later, blow the budgets, later. right? Um, <clears throat> but the chairs, we come in here, and she's like, now i got to tell you about these chairs. She's like, do you like them? I'm like, yeah, they're really cool. I'm they're like, very comfortable, yeah, too. Yeah, they're super comfy. I don't know that I ever would have bought them, yeah. personally, but she's like... I was at Round Top. Round Top? I think that's what it's called in Texas. Yeah, Texas the big, the big, the big market mm-hmm. for like antiquers and all kinds of designers go there to like yeah, buy it's a stuff. Huge for thing. Yeah. It's a huge thing. Right. So she has a space there now, um, but when they do that market, but she was there and she was talking to the guy who had all this stuff, and she's like, "What's the story with these red chairs? I really want them." And he had this old microphone too, which I love is cool. That. Yeah, this yeah. is really cool. And he's like, "These chairs actually belong to Janis Joplin." I bought them from so her. Cool. I bought them from her manager. So Jim was like, "You have to have those." This is part of what blew the budget. Yeah, but well, they are cool. Money well spent. Yeah, but but Janice we need new chairs. Janis Joplin sat Janice here. Joplin chairs. This table that you can't see in front of us belonged to Cheryl Crow. Oh no way! That I was didn't cool. know that. Yeah, she bought that from a, f- a flea market at Cheryl Crow's house. I want. I want to know this girl. You should definitely know Jen. She's amazing. her name's Jen Gash. Her thing's called Gathered Goods. That's her like Instagram. I feel like it's. I she's amazing. Know this brand? Isn't this a brand? Yeah. I mean, it's her. It's not really a brand, but well, I mean, it I, is maybe a brand. I just said the Instagram. It is a brand, but it's not really. It shouldn't have like a yeah, a, like a, you know, shirts or. Well, I mean, I like the story, Walmart. and it kind of ties into what we're talking about today. Which is what your story. Oh, yeah. artists knowing their story. <laughs> the story. The that's value, right. like what, why <laughs> it's so important for an artist to be really connected to their their story, clarifying what that is, and then using their story in everything that they do in their art and why that's really important. But before we do that, mm. we have a few other things we got to take care of. That's true. We should talk <clears> about, because <throat> um, I don't know what you're going to say, other than 
again, the evolving story of us Mm -hmm. in this space and the space as it evolves more. Mm -hmm. Um, Our collaborative working together continues to evolve, Mm -hmm. hence this podcast, which um, we're thankful all you are joining us today. Hope Mm -hmm. you'll share with your friends. And um, I think just the story of the fact that as vocal coaches, I think a lot of times we get... Um, how, how should we say this? I, I feel like a lot of times we get, you know, pushed down to the bottom or deduced down to, well, that's cute and sweet. Oh, yeah. Right? Like yeah. it's, not everyone thinks that way, of course, but that does seem to be a common fiber throughout social circles that, sure. you know, and I think it's maybe because there are, when you're a doctor, you're a doctor. Right. Right. You can be really great at it or you can be really bad, but you're still a doctor. Yeah. As a vocal coach, because there's no like formal training, a cert- a standardized board. Sure. Um, unless you go to yeah. college and get a degree in music, but there's not a governing board of vocal coaches like there are realtors or bankers yeah. or lawyers. You have to pass a test. You have to, even though there's certifications, yeah. there's no standard. There's no standard. And so. You got people all over the board, Mm -hmm. good and bad, but no standard. And so I think um, when you operate at a high standard, like we try to and do, Mm -hmm. um, with excellence, um, it can kind of get overlooked and people, or people just see us as serious and fixing things. And Mm -hmm. part of our story in this whole process is to let you see all of us. Yeah. Well, not all of us. That would be weird. But (laughs) that'd be real weird. Um... (laughs) But enough of us. I didn't think about that until you said en- that. My mind always goes weird places. Yeah, well. Enough of us <laughs> that you know us well. Yeah. And that we're not just your vocal coach or a coach that you look up to or follow, mm-hmm. but we're actually a, just real people who hopefully live really kind of interesting lives and do fun things and work with interesting and fun people. I like to say that I think I lead an interesting life, but to be honest, I'm not really sure that that's the case. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's interesting in the I'm fact middle, that... I'm middle-aged and I'm a mom. <laughs> so. <laughs> but it is nonstop. That's true. It's nonstop. You all they, do fun they keep, stuff. They keep things interesting. You and Tanner got a cool cool little family network and dynamic going over there. Thanks. And, and Thanks. you're part of the world. And, yeah, it's just different. It's Jason, not the same as mine. Why do we have this sitting here? Mm. As we're telling stories, getting to know each other, um, for all you out there that don't know... I do enjoy a martini. It is my drink of choice. And dry gin martini twist stirred with just a splash or rinse of vermouth tossed. Right? Tossed? Twist. Yeah, toss out the vermouth. It's like, oh, I don't like got that it, taste. Got it. um, it's basically just straight gin that's cold <laughs> with a little splash of citrus on it. But I do like do you, them. That's do you my... like it with olives? Do you like them oh, dirty? Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. Only, only, um, I love how you're like, gosh, no. No, 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 no. I can't do that. I like to eat olives. I don't like to drink it, Mm. the, like, juice. So you don't want a a dirty martini. Isn't that what makes a martini dirty is olive juice? It's the olive juice. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that might have more vermouth in it, too, as well, I think. I don't know. I don't like them, so I don't know. Um, I I like them with a twist of citrus. Got it. So it's, like, fresh, clean, crisp, Mm -hmm. just like me. And so... um, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's just, it literally is my drink of choice, that or a glass of wine. That's pretty much all you'll ever see me drink. But being the incredibly social person that I am, I'm known to have a martini here and there. And I used to worry about that because it's like, should I have a martini this often? (laughs) But you know what I read? (laughs) That the queen, if I read this right, if I remember right, the queen would have four cocktails a day. She had this. What? Yeah, she had this thing called, um, it started with a D. Not, uh, the queen who just died? Yeah. Carlos, can you Google that for us, what the queen's drink was? Queen Elizabeth? Yeah, she lived to be like almost 100. Holy smokes. She would sip wine at lunch. She would have wine with her lunch, but she loved these cocktails. She'd have two to four a day. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So. There's, I could not live. It was called a Dubonnet. A Dubonnet. Wait, what is yeah. a Dubonnet? Gin and a Dubonnet with a slice of lemon and a lot of ice. So that, was very for, similar. that was for cocktail yeah, choice? Yeah, it's very similar to what Never I like, it. right? Okay, so, I mean, well, of course, you, you're, you're as- like, the queen says it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anytime you align yourself with the queen, it's going to be okay, yeah. I think. Oh, my gosh. She, she had a dry gin martini. Ah, at lunch, she had a dry gin martini. Oh, my gosh. 
gosh. See, this is fascinating stuff. I did not know about this about the queen. Yeah. She's kind of saucy. She was. She like, wow. yeah, she was. She drank me under the table. She was the queen. <laughs> she also had her little corgis. I think those are cool dogs. I wonder I'd if they had corgi. little cocktails they just at lunch, shed a too. Lot. They probably did. Okay, yeah, so did. back to your oh, martini, so back to the martini shaker. shaker. <laughs> so, you know, incorporating these things into, um, uh, those of you who don't know, maybe yet, we have a reaction uh, playlist on YouTube. Mm -hmm. For those of you viewing this, you know we're on YouTube. Those listening on the other sources of streaming, um, we have visuals of our podcast on YouTube, mm -hmm. Vocal Lab Collective YouTube channel. And so... Mm -hmm. the, uh, we spent a lot of time building that channel a few years in the reaction video space. Yeah. We have fun with that. Mm -hmm. That's another way you guys can really see our personalities is to like yeah. just be funny and silly. It's complete silliness other than we do give some hey, tips. Hey, there's actually some like like legit content it's true. in the yeah, reactions. Because so honestly, like coach reactions kind of drive me crazy on mm -hmm. the internet. You know, so I find it ironic that I, I now do them with you. But um, most of them are just like a coach kind of going, oh. <gasps> Ooh! Yeah. Wow! You know, and I'm like, I learned nothing. It's I true. I feel like I just wasted my time, and those bother me. Okay, this is come at me if you want, whatever. That's just my that's my thing. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to add some value. I'm going to actually say something that I think is then then matters. Well, and to matters. be fair, that's that was my battle. Yeah, I started yeah. doing that channel by myself when I was living in LA. Yeah. And I really fought it because it just felt like. Part of it was my ego, like I'm, sure. I'm a serious coach, I shouldn't do this, exactly what we're yeah. talking about, right? Yeah. I was afraid even my own way to let people see another side of me other mm -hmm. than the serious coaching side when I was putting it out on social media. Yeah. And that's kind of silly to even think about, right? Um, yeah, I realized that I can have ego involved in that, right? I can be no, like, it's can't. not beneath me to do a reaction. No. But what I've enjoyed about bringing another level to it is that it's, one, exposed me to a lot of music I would have never, ever listened yeah. to before. Because we do a lot of reactions to international music, yeah. pop music from around the world. And then, two, it's they are fun. It is actually it is fun, really fun to... It helps my own diagnostic ear because I'm like, mm -hmm. look, look, I've got to like really say something that is of value and of worth to the listener that's not a waste of anybody's time or energy just for a shallow laugh. But as a result, it's actually made my diagnostic ear a little bit more fine-tuned because I, I'm like, okay, I, I need true. to listen and pay attention and think about what's what's going on in this singer's voice. And that <laughs> actually has implications in my my day-to-day -day life in coaching. And makes you a better singer. Yeah. Inadvertently. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Even though you're not singing, you still yeah, become like a better singer. Yeah, it's like an indirect singer. thing for sure. But, yeah. um, but they're because they're fun and funny. Like I do forget sometimes that that's a very valuable part of my own existence and my contribution to the world. Right? It's my own humor and sense of humor. And actually, 100%. I learned that a lot through Instagram. So I started really indulging yeah. my Instagram page. <laughs> Which you've done more, fantastic A couple with. years ago. Yeah, and it's grown quite a bit. And maybe it took a while. And mm -hmm. it took a while for me to find my own voice in Instagram world and reels and videos and stuff. I'm not a stranger to being in front of a camera at all. Um, I've done so many things in front of a camera for especially in the coaching world that that wasn't hard. I think it was the the quickness, the like add crazy value in 90 seconds or less, also make it funny, you know? Yeah. And while I like to think that I'm funny, okay, um, <laughs> it was hard for me to figure out how to be that intentional with my words, my point I'm trying to make, and instill my own sense of humor. So it really made me have to get more acquainted with myself, and who I truly am and let my personality come through, don't self-edit so much and all of those kinds of things. Which and taps into your my vulnerability story. Yeah, and, and, my, and your story. Exactly. And so, um, I mean, it's paid dividends in my business yeah. for sure. Of, I'm not by any means like the world's best real maker, but <laughs> I do like to have fun with some of them sometimes. And sometimes yeah. I get, like I'll play two roles, you know, and I like to do... I have a theater background, so I like to tap into it that comes as out. well. You can tell. When but. I think that's part of the beauty of all that as well is like as coaches and working with artists, um, it allows us to also express the more humorous or playful side mm -hmm. of what we do. Yeah. And it's not just all serious business or work. Yeah. There's times for that for sure, but 
Yeah, it's it's. I think back to this point in the Queen. <laughs> I, Let's bring it back to the Queen. Yeah. So you know when I. So again, long long story short here, with my progression, getting really comfortable and and dialing into my own personal brand. Mm-hmm. Really, before COVID, when I left the group Tenore, I really started thinking about this new record, doing the Crooners record. All of this started to make sense. I get locked down on the farm. What the farm being a horse farm, mm-hmm. right? I, part of me, I'd always struggled with like, <laughs> you know, my dad wanted me to sing country music, but I didn't really fit in country. Yeah. So through that transition or through that progression of like Tenore and doing standards and big band stuff and theater, all that, wow, on the backside, I start went to do this new record and everything just starts to make more sense. Yeah. Like, Locked down on a farm. It's a horse farm. So I'm walking through the fields during COVID, working on this crooner record with these beautiful, amazing like show horses. Not mm-hmm. even like a just a you know field horse. These are like amazing horses. If <laughs> if you've seen them, yeah. <clears throat> all of that the martini, all of that wearing suits. Like I realized, like my dad always told me my whole life. I remember one time in college, my dad sent me this article. I think it was like from President Bush or something. I don't know. It was like World. the reason to wear suits, you know? And yeah. like, I think it was, yeah, I think George W. made everyone wear suits in the White House again or something. I think that was a story. I don't know. Huh. They were not before then? Well, I think, I don't That's know. I'm, I'm making things up. I think there might have been a little like more relaxed casualness during the Clinton. Casual Fridays? Yeah, during the Clinton years, maybe. Where your um, golf attire, maybe? I could be talking out of my butt right now, but that's what my dad, I remember him saying. (laughs) I just remember him sending this article, and I'm like, my dad wants me to wear a suit to class. This is weird, but my dad would have loved that if I had. But Did you? Oh, there, we actually, the college I went to at first, we did have to dress up at times. Oh, really? I think it was like Fridays or something, or maybe it was Mondays. I don't know. That was probably because of the fraternity, though, not the college. Yeah, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, over time, I started to realize that I look best in a suit. You do I look nice in a do. suit, Jason. And everyone acknowledges that when I have on a suit. Mm-hmm. And you so, look like <coughs> you should wear one. Like, that just looks like your uniform. It all fits the brand, right? It does. You have a strong sense of brand. Back and to the, the martini. martini. So as your resident crooner, whether yeah. we're doing reaction videos, uh-huh. whether we're sitting here on a podcast, or whether you're watching me sing a tune in a show, the brand comes through. That's mm-hmm. my personal story now. Mm-hmm. And so I've thought it would be a fun bit here on the podcast. And now people are going to think about you when they see a martini or, or a shaker. Absolutely. Intentional. Or when they hear <clears throat> Buble. Buble. They're like, oh, that's, that's yeah. like Jason. Yeah. So this is a new little bit we're going to introduce here. We, we should come up with a name for it. But basically, this little martini mm. shaker has... Tell us what it should be called, people. Yeah, let us know if you have a thought for this bit. We'll definitely come up with a name for it. But um, in this martini shaker, Shelby, Mm -hmm. there are four questions. Okay. We're going to pull one out or two out each, okay? Just one at a time. But we're going to start with you. Go to the martini shaker. You're going to read to the lovely people out there what your question says. Oh, you got to. Hold it, too. Okay. Okay. All right. Top three singers and why? Ooh. Like why? I didn't get that one. I always... My top three singers, like in my opinion, that I love the most. Um, Who were my top three? Sure, you make it what you want it to be, but that's how I would read it. Okay. <laughs> well, you wrote the question, so <laughs> cats out of the back. Um, okay. Mm. Top three singers probably are um, Eva Cassidy. Mm-hmm. If you all don't know who she Huge is, fan of her. Look her up. After this podcast. I always say this. I am grieved in my soul that mm. I will never be able to see her live That's on how I feel planet. about Michael yeah, Jackson. Yeah, true. Yeah. I wish I could have seen him. Gosh. I feel that way about Whitney, too. Yeah. Um, man, Eva Cassidy was the most undervalued, um, arguably, <laughs> artist. I mean, she died really young. She was like 30-something when she died. She and died we only cancer. have like a, a short like three years or so of her music, right? I don't even know. That's yeah, a good question. Yeah, it was question. a very short time span. She, she did, yeah, like Americana slash, I mean, kind of folk, but also a little she, jazz. She was a precursor to like uh, Sheryl Crow or Nora Jones. Or, yeah. Uh, right? Like kind there's, of a there's combo of them. Yeah, maybe. combo. Like, yeah, and she, I mean, oh my gosh. If you go and listen to, if I had to listen to only one of her songs forever and ever, it would be, 
Oh, I had a golden thread. Oh, I don't know that one. I thought you were going to say Songbird. Oh, that one is so good. So good. That's the one she's most famous for. Did you introduce me to her or to Brett? I don't know. I'm trying to remember who introduced me to her stuff. It was through our time at coaching together at at Brett Manning Studios that um, I would use her at times, too. I still do pull her out to, like, as a demonstration for females. Coaching example, yeah. Yeah, coaching example. But her voice was amazing. so incredible. Like, it was so pure, so beautiful. She could do so much with it. Her mix mm. and her power was insane. Mm. But, and so easy. Her range, like, it was, it, I mean, I don't like to use this word, but I will because it fits. It was epic. Uh. But her artistry, usually she stayed in, a, like, a really chill place and really emotive and connected. And, gosh, her phrasing was just Freezing so, was so, so spot good. on. I but think then she'd I, open up into these crazy notes. You're mm. like, what? What's happening? You know? I, I think of her as like mm. mastering the art of subtleties. Yeah. To have the most explosive yeah. uh, results yeah. in her voice, right? And a teaching tip real quick because it just popped in my mind. Mm. For you all out there who are singers and want to be better singers, if you aren't listening to lots of other singers and great singers, you mm. got to go back in time even. Yeah. And different genres. I don't care what genre you love and want to sing. If you aren't listening to a very cross section of music, mm-hmm. you're doing a disservice to yourself as an artist. Yeah. Right. And yeah. It's, it's crazy how many people don't. But okay, it's, so it's true. Eva Cassidy. Okay, so Eva Cassidy. I'll go through these other ones faster, um, even though that's hard for me. <laughs> um, Celine Dion. <sighs> I mean, truly. <clears throat> Have you seen the documentary yet? No, I haven't. And I haven't this is, either. I am grieved in my soul Ugh. and honestly embarrassed to admit that I haven't watched it yet. Because Same. I was so excited to, for it to come out, like counting down the, the days. But here's the thing, okay? I live with all these people at my house <laughs> that I birthed <laughs> and or married. Lots and, of activity out there. Um, yeah. And... One, when they go to bed, which is like parents, you're like, yeah, I watch TV after my kids go to bed. I did that when I had one kid and I, they went to bed <laughs> at like 7 p.m. Yeah. That's not real real life for me anymore. Yeah. I have three of them. They are older. It is summer. They stay up later. By the time they find, I'm like begging them to go to bed <laughs> so that I can go to bed. Because they still wake up early, I bet. Yeah. Ish. They sleep okay. in a little bit more in the summer. It's that I get up before they do. Uh. But thankfully, however... I, I refuse to watch it on, like, an iPad, okay? Yeah, no. I need a cinematic experience. I need better speakers. You and those gone are the theater. The big t- I know. I freaking should have seen it in the theater. I didn't know they, about it I need my gone. big TV in my living room with the big speakers yeah. and the speakers that are, like, all over the house. We should have a watch party at your house. Yeah. But I have to kick everybody out. Like... You know what I mean? Because here's the thing. They go to bed, then I could turn it on. Do you know what I want to do? I want to go to bed. I don't right. want to watch a documentary. So I want to have, like, in the middle of the day, and no one's home, and I can, like, blast Well, here's it. what we need to do. You, let's, send, let's send your kids to the in-laws for a night. Yeah. Carlos and his wife and me and my—I don't even have a fish— I'll just, I'll come with bring my martini, martini shaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the yeah. martinis. Toss out your You remote. and Tanner will have a little snacks and nibbles and we'll watch, we'll watch <laughs> the Celine Dion documentary. This sounds like a great right? time. It's going to be great. You, we'll all cry. Then we'll turn on Tanner the best. Tanner may not cry. he may be like, what? Yeah, Tanner will be like, these people are weird. I don't know how to get mixed up with them. He we'll, did cry during Frozen too. <laughs> this sorry, is a, this sorry, is Tanner. Y'all need Tanner. Blast. That's that made me really chuckle. Right it's there. very emotional. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a carry on. <clears throat> but no, we'll do that. Then we'll put on the best of Celine Dion, have one last little martini, and we'll leave you and Tanner for a night without the kids. Oh, some, thanks. All right, Celine Dion. See how we just hey, this set is that a PG up? podcast. That's a okay. perfect, perfect. We work hard to not have the E on this podcast. I don't think that made it E. What I don't. I don't e? know. Cursing. Don't make me. I don't know. <laughs> okay, and then my third one is Elvis. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Gosh. Only one of those people I've seen live. It's Celine. Saw her in Vegas. Changed my life. I cried like 17 times. I was very pregnant. I've seen, that's me too. But I've seen Celine. Elvis. I would have given anything to see Elvis. Elvis. I would yeah. love to have seen all those people passing out. Totally. Yeah. I did see the Elvis movie. That was really good. Okay. That was that. Was that. that was one my time I, I was <clears throat> in Norway for a... Um, a music expo that we were throwing over there. And at the time I was working, this was like 2018, I think. I was working with the band Why Don't We. It was an amazing boy band that I worked with. Um, they were on their blow-up um, 
or their rise before they did have a little blow up, but <laughs> on their rise and uh, they were playing in Oslo. So I went to the show mm-hmm. and um, no, I take that back. That's the wrong show. It was earlier in their career. I went to Phoenix mm. and they had those, you know, those barricades up front that they put, yeah. and, like the people can stand on them. I'd never been behind one of those mm-hmm. really. I don't think. So I'm just sitting there watching all these girls, the young teenage girls are packed to the front. I mean, they're packed in there, like 3,000 of them. And about maybe 20, 30 minutes into the show, some of them start passing out and fainting. Is it because so my there's, job, there's not enough oxygen because they're smushing each other? It was a little bit of yeah. both. It was partly the five boys they were just like enthralled with. And it was also, they were getting squished in I mean, the Beatles. Low the Beatles yeah. had this effect So on my them. job became helping security pull these young girls over the barricades and two oh paramedics. I'd never seen anything <laughs> like it, but it was really fun That's a for fun me. life experience. Not fun for the girls. <laughs> but... <laughs> okay, I got to do a martini. <clears throat> okay. If you could do anything else, what? Would it be? Oh, I know what mine is. I know what mine is. If I could do anything else, I would be... I've always said there's two things I'd love to do, if not this. Not be in music. One would be to host a TV show. You'd be great at that. And so this kind of... This scratches that itch, as they say. Yeah. As we say here in America. Um, Hosting our little TV show. Yeah, so this kind of gives me that. But I always thought it would have been fun to have, like, a morning show. Mm -hmm. Like, you know... um, Yeah. Like Kelly and Mark now mm-hmm. was Kelly and Regis, Ke- Regis and Kathy Lee, all that. Yeah, Hoda and Kathy Lee, Hoda and, Hoda and Jenna. Ryan, I love Ryan, Ryan Seacrest. There. Ryan does everything. Um, <laughs> Bobby Bone. Yeah. Um, but since this kind of does that for me a little bit, I'm going to go with it'd be really cool to be an ambassador to a really cool country. Like France. That would literally never be my answer. Sweden, Norway. But I, you'd be good like, at it. Yeah. I, would I don't love, think I would. I would love to be an ambassador. Because mm-hmm. all you do, not all you do, that, I shouldn't deduce <laughs> it to that. All you do is this. Th- your main point is to <clears throat> be a liaison to the president and mm-hmm. the government, right? Mm-hmm. And so your main job, you have obviously um, diplomats that are working in the embassy doing all the passports, to all the stuff that an embassy does. But the actual ambassador, by and large, is... Um, there for meetings, hosting events, doing public appearances, hosting parties at the ambassador's residence, which are always really cool. Have you ever been to one? Yeah, and that'd be super cool. The Canadian one. Oh. Um, yeah, I'd be a chef, like a super fancy one. Oh, mm-hmm. that's like, cool. Like one of those chefs at um, like Catbird Seat. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. When we come over to watch Celine Dion, you're going to cook. Oh, but I don't know how to do it. Oh, oh, I, I can cook. I can cook. Okay. I can't cook super fancy like that. But you would like I would to love go to be back able to and do that. be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Do you watch was, a lot of like else. Um, Food Network? I used to. I used to watch a lot. I love me of some food, food Network. Some Food TV. Some Food Food Network. But you know what? I love the I love the Food Network of about five years ago when it was more like thirty minute cooking shows, and yes. now it's become all these competitions. And I just don't. Yeah, get into I don't them. watch it anymore. But that's also I don't again. Get it. I because watch it every Saturday children. morning if I'm home from like 8 a.m. to about 11 a.m. Oh, that's, that's a lot. That's my Saturday morning. That's a, I mean, I'm kind of in and out. Yeah. I don't just like sit there. Um, yeah. I don't really ever watch TV anymore. Back to the martini shaker. Hence my beef with not watching Celine I should have made us martinis while we do this. What is your singing horror story? Oh, like oh. the worst singing experience I've ever had kind of thing? That's a fun one. Oh. I don't know this about you. I don't have any. Oh, oh. <laughs> perfection. I'm joking. But I need to think about this for a second. Okay, so the worst experience I've ever had on stage. Well, <clears throat> this isn't, I don't know if this is worthy. I was an understudy, so I did a lot of musical theater. I was an understudy for my dear friend who was the lead, and I was, it was like community theater, and it was in my hometown in Panama City, Florida. And we were putting on um, Once Upon a Mattress. Do you know that musical? <laughs> no. It's based I've off the Princess that. and the Pea fairy tale oh, story okay. yeah. or whatever. And, and actually, the Broadway cast, the original princess for this musical was um, Sarah Jessica Parker, I believe. Mm. It was like the OG, I think. Before Sex and the City. She was at least the most famous princess in that mm. role. Um, I don't know if it was before Sex and the City. It, it's a good question. Probably. Probably. But I don't know. Anyway, um, 
So she was, my friend was the, the lead character. I was the supporting princess, or lady, I was a lady in waiting, and um, kind of the supporting actress. Well, opening night comes, and my friend gets horribly ill and can't go on. I was her understudy. Which is hilarious if you think about it, the fact that the supporting lead was the lead's understudy. But it was because it was a really small community theater. We just sit in sure. a ton of people, right? Yeah. And so I had an understudy. I had never rehearsed the lead role. I'd never rehearsed it. I knew it pretty well because we were in rehearsals Gosh, so I'd much. I'd be a nervous wreck for that. Oh, I was so, Golly. so nervous. I don't know if I've ever been as nervous as I was on stage as I was for that, but That's I did have good. to perform her role just once. She was able to like rally and get back on stage like the next night, but, yeah. um, and it was a relatively short run for community theater, but anyway, it was not horrible, like I did a bad job, but it was my own inner horror of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to do this. <laughs> and because I literally never rehearsed it, I think we might have done like an emergency rehearsal that afternoon before the show, but I was like, I don't know the choreography because there's actually quite a lot of dancing in that role. Um, I pretty much knew the songs, but I had to. Rem I didn't know all of her lines. I didn't know the blocking. I didn't know the choreography, and we just sort of hacked our way through it and made it work. Hmm. Um, I do remember having <coughs> to sing the big song. The big song was um, "Shy," is the big lead character's song. If anybody knows this musical, you know the song. And there's a lot of like swinging around and just big, big moments. And it was probably a little bit out of my comfort zone for my voice at the time too, because this was really well before I knew anything about mixed voice, mm -hmm. had a belt, quote unquote, as the people like to say. You were just pushing say. them notes. I was just having to shout. Yeah, I did not know how to mix. <laughs> so I was just shouting. Shout and not I was belting. the pants. That's and it what was you not, were doing. <laughs> gosh, I wanted to shout my pants because I was so nervous. So, like, <laughs> ah, so you anyway. were keeping it PG. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That was that was it. Oh, I that guess. was it. Okay. Like I'm sure I had plenty of um, gaffes in that performance, but I think I've probably blocked them out. That's I don't so know. good. I have to ask my mom. Do you want to know mine? She'd remember. In a quick yeah. way. Yeah. Probably my most horrific, but in a funny way, was um, I was doing. This is probably about oh seven oh eight. I was doing a at the time I was doing a lot of like church music, mm -hmm. and I had like a you know like a concert ministry. I would go around the country and. I did a lot of women's events and a lot of like senior adult events because I was like a quote unquote Christian version of like a Josh Groban. Oh yeah. So it fit well with those audiences. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I was at this huge women's event in Oklahoma City for the Oklahoma Baptist Convention. Mm. There's like thousands of women in this huge room, and I get up, I'm doing my thing. And at this point, I was doing just a, like an hour concert, okay? Mm -hmm. Had a piano player, had my sound guy, and we were using like performance tracks. And I had, at the time, I had this little bit I would do. I would do two or three songs, open it up, and then I would come in and introduce myself, talk, talk about me, um, growing up, all this. And at one point, because during that time especially, it was interesting because I could always see on people's faces, like they when I'd walk onto stage, they would expect me to be more like a singer-songwriter like Chris Tomlin or someone. Mm -hmm. But then I open up with this big voice, and it's just like, whoa, I'm kind of shocked that that voice comes out of this, you know, more smaller... Humble brag. Smaller frame picture, right? Yeah. yeah. We love a humble brag around here. <laughs> um, and so, um, I just look back at Carlos. It looked like his chest was sweaty. Do you see that? It's just a shadow. <laughs> but I was like, I do see that why now. is yeah. Carlos's chest just Carlos full of sweat? Carlos is the brilliant man behind the yeah. camera, everyone. He, he's loving these combos so much, yeah. he's just sweating back there. Um, <laughs> but, so, well, I was at the humble brag part. That's my favorite My voice part. was so amazing oh, yeah, and yeah. huge, and everybody yeah. was so like, So I could whoa. see people's faces be like, whoa, that's a big voice. And I'm not a big guy, right? And no, so, that was always fun. So I had this little bit, I would always say, yeah, it's crazy how God decided to give me this big voice in a really small body, okay? And I made this, I made this, there was these jokes I would do because people would, sometimes they would think I was Chris Tomlin or there were like three or four people I would get confused with at that time. I'd be somewhere and be like, oh, are you that guy? Mm. Um, and so I did this little funny bit, came down to that little punchline. Well, at this women's event, thousands of women again, right, in the crowd, I don't realize I say this, but I say, for some reason, God decided to give me a really big voice 
in a small package. <laughs> but it sounded that. like I said, and a small package. <laughs> I mean, the, the room like busted in laughter. I mean, they busted in laughter. I was like, wow, that joke's never gone over that well. And I don't realize it, but my piano guy has just oh put his God. head down on the piano and he's, he can't control it. Control it. Oh my gosh. And I see my, like, my buddy that was doing sound, he was like, and I'm like, that joke just really hit. They were not picking it up. That's so, so funny. Did they then tell you like well, eventually after, later? After that session was over, go out to the lobby where my merch table is. And, you know, talking, selling CDs, talking All to people. All these Baptist women were for Yeah, they were buying CDs like crazy, too. It was great. <laughs> and... <laughs> oh, my gosh. My piano guy came out, Aaron, at that time, came out, and he's like, he's like, dude, I can't believe you did that. I was like, what? He's like, you just told 5,000 women that you, that God gave you <laughs> a big voice and a small package. I'm like, what? He's like, you told 5,000 women that you have a small package. And I'm like, no, I did not. I was mortified. And there was this lady standing there looking at my, one of my CDs, and she's like, she just paused and looked up, and she said, oh, honey, you said it all right. I'm still going to buy your CD, but you said it. I'm like, that's why you're buying the CD, actually. <laughs> Isn't that good? Oh, that is funny. That's a fun I one. I haven't heard that one. Yeah. About so. you. There's one left, right? That should be called... Two truths and a lie. I I'll bet you all. could. I bet you could I'll dominate you that game. Honestly. Discern that. <laughs> Humble brags and subtle jokes. <laughs> oh, that goodness. was good. Here we go. How do you know music was your future career, or how did you know? How do you know? <laughs> you wrote this, you know, your own handwriting. How did you? How did you know music was your future career? I think I've told this before. Um, I know. When the little lady gave you a dollar. That's right. That's how I knew. When you were how old? Two. Two years old. I didn't know that then, but throughout, you know, Mm -hmm. had the natural gifting for that, and so my parents just kept having me do it. Yeah, we told that story, actually, on the the earlier earlier episode. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, But, I mean, that's how I knew. Yeah. Again, it's all... The sweet little lady at church, you sang at church, Jesus loves me, Mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, Jesus loves me. She came out and gave me a dollar. And she gave you a dollar. And I kept doing it. And I learned at a small (laughs) age that if I open my mouth and sing... Dollars will come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's not a bad mindset to adopt when it comes to your art because even mm. though that's not the reason that we're in it, there's such a, we talk about this a lot, there's such this like scarcity poverty mindset yes. in art in general. But in our ver- our sphere of art being music and singing and singers that, I don't know, people just <laughs> think there's no money to be had. Everybody's making money except me, the singer, or me, the artist, you know. And so to have a different vantage point from a young age, I think is largely valuable. And I think that's why you're quite the like entrepreneur mindset. You're kind of like the, what's a new idea? What's a way that I can not make money, but bring art, but even though money is a part of the Yeah, equation. I mean, they, they have to go together. Yeah, yeah. So Unless I'm, you just have like, huge vats of money sitting around. Right. You just pull from that pool, but I don't have that. No. So. Right. Yeah, no, it, it was, um, yeah, I'm thankful for that because yeah. it did, arguably, I might not still be in music had I not learned that little lesson that yeah. you have to struggle and you have to drive and you have to hustle and you have to mm-hmm. not give up on your passion and keep going at it and there will be moments of abundance of money there'll be moments of struggle for money all of it but that's part of the journey that's what makes it cool Mm -hmm. so it makes it fun and interesting and that again is what makes your story your story yeah and i think we're seeing over time um you would agree with this that it's it's cool over the past few years in music to see a rise in um people who've stuck with their art for the long haul and not given up especially in music we've always seen that in acting, uh, painting, other art forms, winemaking for sure. Well, because it takes so long. It takes so long. It does. But (laughs) You have to be in it for the long game when you're making wine. You do. And so, you know, music's a little different because we can make great records at an early age. And we've seen that. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's, it still does not take away from or, um, you know, trump the long game Mm -hmm. and just, Staying true to your passion and and not giving up on it. And we're seeing more yeah. people like that as they, you know, get in their late twenties, thirties, and forties and beyond. And we've talked about this before too, I think, where 
we're seeing their the reward for that, where they didn't give up, and yeah. all of a sudden mm-hmm. eyes start to pay more attention and ears start to listen more. And part of that, I think you that your, is your you thing. get better, right? You get in better. time because you've iterated and you've tried so many things, you've lived more life, yeah, so you, you have start more to know experience yourself better. to draw you, from, and you actually you have a authentic. story. Yes, I mean, I think that's ultimately why, right? But it's funny because our culture really <laughs> like obsesses over the young hot thing, and so there is still. A mindset in this industry that you—it's a young man's game, and what, to be successful, you got to be in your twenties or younger. Sometimes. Yeah, and here's an interesting point to that. <clears throat> That's still true, but guess what's kind of taken that over now? That used to be the um, you know um, big powerhouse movie production companies or the big record labels that were controlling that narrative, and mm-hmm. they were finding young people, people, and and. <laughs> grooming them to be the stars, right? right? What's taken that over now? Uh, social media. Maybe? Social media. Yeah. So you have all these young people. All they have to do is like look really cute and hot. Take their shirts off if they're guys, and the girls wear whatever they wear. Whatever like they wear. that gets so many eyeballs on them. But we're seeing that doesn't automatically transfer into longevity. Longevity or put it because so many want to do records, make music. They put out music and it doesn't happen. Yeah, so that's true, and and that goes back to again the story's not there yet. Yeah, it's like you're. It's a good point because you may be this young hot thing visually, but if your music is actually not as good as your body, <laughs> I mean, you know, if that's what people are falling in love with, people aren't going to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, because people's ears are paying attention like if I'm driving down the road I'm listening to music I'm not watching a music video or if I'm running sure. I don't run but if I'm lifting yeah. that's what I do um, I might be listening to the music I'm not watching it right so the music still has to hit it still has to be good enough and if it's not because your story is not great and you haven't crafted that whole part of it yet then it's not it's not going to land to your audience and so you, you have to work on more than just your hot bot you do. And your brand you do. Deals. And, and, and <laughs> that's kind of one of the cool things that we're seeing through this whole process, I think. Mm-hmm. And obviously with all the talent shows, it all revolves around a story. Yeah. So for you out there who are like, I don't care if you're trying to do music or, you know, star to dry cleaners. Like, there has to be some component yeah. to your story and why you're doing this and why you um, are passionate about it. Yeah. Or... Even if it's a business that you don't really have great passion for and you're just trying to make a business make money, there still has to be something that connects to people. Right. That reinforces the importance and the beauty and the uniqueness of that brand. Yeah, and it brings trust. It Trust is what it really does give. You know, I think if you think about your favorite artists, the moment you find out something personal about them that mm-hmm. connects to you, then you're like die hard. Like you might love a song or love an artist's sound and their their voice and their style and all that kind of stuff, but when you learn a little bit about them personally, all of a sudden you're like, "I'm coming to your concert." Yes. Here's all my money, right? Because you need that that bit of connection. That's why somebody like Taylor Swift is so wildly successful. Oh, it's it's all about her story. Yeah. We know all of her I mean, story. We really do. Like I know a lot more than I feel like I. Me I'm too. a very casual listener, to be completely frank, on Taylor Swift. I'm not <laughs> like a Swifty. Yeah. Um, I know enough, right? I'm familiar enough with stuff. To, but, and I'm like, wow, I know all sorts of things. Yeah. About you. As a casual, as listener, a casual listener, you know a lot. I, yeah, about her. which is like wild success in branding and storytelling. It's crazy. Her, her I orbit. think that's the brilliance I get that of who she's she is. A massive artist. Like I understand them comparing anybody to Taylor Swift is ridiculous, but. But she's done that her whole career. She's done it from day one. But the comparison is this. Everyone has a story. Yeah. I've worked with so many artists on the development side of things. And even just more, like, um, general with just working on their voice. And I'm consistently amazed at how many feel they don't have a story. Oh, we all do. I mean, yeah. you've been alive for however many years. You've mm-hmm. got a story. Yeah. We just think so often it has to be sensationalized. It's mm-hmm. got to be like, you know, I lost 14 cats in a house fire and <laughs> almost like, that's why I don't have hair on this side of my head because I almost got me too. Like, I mean, we you think we have to have those stories. Here's but a story I want to know. Hmm. Speaking of losing hair, okay? I want to know why Charlie Puth has a scar in the middle of his eyebrow. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Somebody tell us. 
But that's part of his story. It is. It's and also it's part like of his brand. Kind of an iconic part of his face. Yeah. And I'm like, why? Remember when guys were doing scar? that for a little bit? They were shaving like shaving. At eyebrow. first, I thought he did that, and then I'm like, no, this is a scar. Mm. And I saw a childhood picture, and he still had that scar. Like mm. he, it happened early in his life. Carlos is nodding. I think. Do you know? Yeah, he just had an accident as a kid. Hit something. It was a cat. Pretty back. Yeah. He no. didn't lose yeah. 14 cats in a house fire. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Dang it. Maybe it's not a good story, and that's why we don't. <laughs> maybe he doesn't tell it because it's yeah. like, well, actually, it's really lame. <laughs> <laughs> has a scar on his face and it was because he was playing with a sword. He was playing with a oh sword my gosh. Ed Sheeran. He was like sword fighting and got like Oh cut no. Himself. So if you look at his face, he's got a bit of a scar on his cheek and from <coughs> sword fighting. Hmm. So that's really? Wow. Carlos used to sword fight with his friends growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know a funny story oh about me? Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're going to have to end with he this story. Really, I feel like this he, is getting long. really set me up for that. I used to, this is horrible, I used to chase, my dad had this old sword from the Civil War that hung on the mantle down mm, the basement. I had one of those in my, in my house. I used to up. chase my babysitter with it, and she would, like, lock herself in the bedroom. because kind of hellion kind of were you? I was a mean kid. And How were you? I, I could, can't see that. I could just, like, have the house to myself. Well, you're the baby, right? Yes. Of your family? That's and kind of only child. The baby's, like, the baby of the family is the most charming and the most, like, like evil and conniving, mm. you know. I really got that out on the system as a kid. Well, that's good. I was a mean yeah. little kid, not not consistently, mm-hmm. but like it would just come out like in that scenario. Mm-hmm. I remember one time my sister brought her boyfriend over, and I had no reason. I was just standing at the top of the stairs, and I just threw a hammer at him and hit him in the head. Oh my god! <laughs> it's a true story. Was he okay? No, it was, it was a screwdriver. Sorry, it was a screwdriver. Was he okay? No, it cut him. He was bleeding. Oh I got in so much trouble. <laughs> and that was. Really cool. But I used to have these little. Charlie yeah, that was. <laughs> I'm the that one. would be amazing if that Charlie was. Poop and that's how I know Charlie Poop. Gosh, that'd be incredible. That would be incredible. Didn't you story. say he was the one you sat next to recently at the Soho House? Yeah, at the Soho House, house yeah. Okay, next time you see him at the Soho House, because it's last year of life. Okay? I love that we call Please it the him. Soho House, like the Walmart, the Kroger. <laughs> Is it not called Southern that? people, you guys, we put... Soho House? S- Southern people do one of two things. They either put the in front of a word or like a brand, mm-hmm. the Kroger, or they put an S on the end of it. You want it, Or like a K. Like I've heard some people say, you want to go to the Walmart? Or what? I've never do you want to go to that. Kroger's? It's I've not Kroger. heard that either. Well, Who do you hang out with? I mean, we're talking like real Southern. Like you got to go to small towns. Not Brentwood, Tennessee. Not Brentwood. <laughs> a little That's more not refined. What the little Brentwood people say. A little more refined. I don't say. I don't say that in Brentwood. <laughs> you like we don't even have Kroger. <laughs> you, Actually, we do. Yeah, it's very close do. to my house. That's a nice one. Um, well, you know what I want to say about this conversation today is yes. the, and I, I think we both did this on purpose and not on purpose because we believe in the flow of the conversation and planning things, but also having an organic flow. But the intentionality behind this conversation around stories, Mm. right, was the intention, hence questions, so that we would tell stories. But the reality is, is inadvertently, doesn't it, everyone, make you feel more connected to us? And... And you're not even trying to buy our music right now. Like it, no, yeah. it's just the point of it's engaging to people. It makes you feel connected to someone when you it hear does. their story. And so this is why it's so important to start telling yours, to start putting them out there, incorporating them into what you're doing. Thread them into your shows. Thread them into your um, social media, into your networking interactions with human beings. Yes. Like people are like, I don't know how to what to talk about. Just tell stories. Just tell story. Right. That's all anyone does. And it's all anybody actually really wants to mm-hmm. hear. I love mm-hmm. hearing people tell stories. You don't have to sell anything. You just yeah. have to show who you are. And the product will sell itself. Yeah. And if that's music, it's music. If it's if you the know, product's good, martini shakers, arguably. it's that. Yeah. yeah. And even not sometimes, right? Well, if it, people connect, it, they'll buy anything. And even this has been fun because we've learned more about. I've each heard a few stories that yeah, I had right? not heard about you. Yeah. There's so much to uncover. In people. Like the small package. Yeah. <laughs> that's a funny one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. But, oh man. <laughs> so the power of story, you guys, it uh, can't be underestimated or understated. Right. Just, and it goes back to yeah. the common theme of just let people see who you are. Yeah. And um, be a good human while you do it. Yeah. That's all I ask. And have a martini or two. Or two. It really helps, yeah. I think. Apparently, that's what the queen that's would do. That's what the queen did. And we should all be more like the queen. What would Queen Elizabeth do? I'm probably going to get some hate for that because they're going to be like, she was a... <laughs> 
People have <laughs> the queen's very polarizing. I feel like uh, anything is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anything we all, we is. all have we all have hills to die <laughs> we on. We do. Hey, we should wrap this. You guys, thanks for joining us today. Hit us on the socials. Um, you can email us at support at vocalabcollective dot com. Let us know any questions, thoughts, comments, or even your story, and mm-hmm. we'll uh, maybe share a few of them along the way. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. This has been fun, Shelby. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Jason Catron. I'm Shelby Rollins. And this is the Vocal Lab Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Vocal Lab Podcast. Ready to join the top ranks of the music industry? Don't forget to follow and subscribe for more first class conversations that make the extraordinary your new ordinary. Until next time, keep striving for your top note.